It's time for the Game Show Fans Podcast with Josh and Danny. Hello and welcome to episode three of the Game Show Lovers Podcast. Uh, I am Joshua McLeod and with me as always is... Danny Lewis. And we are here to re-record episode three. I guess that would make this episode 3.1 because uh, due to some technical glitches we ended up losing the audio for episode three. Yeah, and we thought the audio was very good, and we didn't want to lose it, so we're going to re-record it. Yeah. Let's hope we're as brilliant as we were during that. Oh, yeah. But the uh, subject for this episode of Game Show Lovers podcast is game sh- American game shows that were more successful in other countries, or shows yeah. that we saw in the U.S. They may not have necessarily originated here, some of them certainly did, but shows that were much more popular or successful when they had foreign versions in other countries. Danny thought of this idea. Mm-hmm. I did. Yep. And it's a good one because there are a lot, and the idea was initially inspired by one of your favorite shows, which is... Lingo. Lingo, 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 which originated... Actually, it's a weird story behind Lingo. Uh, I guess I can go into it because I know the most... I assume you want me to. Lingo originated in the I U.S. Think no, it originated in the, the U.S. US. Oh, okay. started in the U.S. in 1987 uh, by Ralph... It was a Ralph Edwards production. No, not Ralph Edwards, but Ralph Andrews production. Let me start that. Yeah. Okay. Started by Ralph Andrews Productions, uh, who developed the format, I believe, for syndication, and it was originally hosted by uh, Ron Michael Reagan. Michael Reagan. Yeah, Ron Michael Ro- Reagan. Yeah. Michael Reagan, Ronald Reagan's son. Adopted son. Mm-hmm. And halfway through the series, he left the show, and Ralph Andrews ended up hosting the rest of the run of the series. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, the series, I guess, didn't do super well in the ratings because a bunch of the contestants ended up not getting their prize money. That's right. <laughs> yeah. The production company went bankrupt. Yep. And that was really the end of it for Ralph Andrews. I think that was. I don't think he ever produced anything after that. Yeah. And in an attempt to keep the company alive, I'm guessing, he sold the format to the Netherlands. And they did very successful with it. Yep. Their version, which ran forever. Mm-hmm. It's not still a lot of it. At least 15 years. Yeah, it's, I don't think it's still on, but it was on for a very long time. It wrapped up uh, in the Netherlands. Okay, it lasted from 1989 to 2014 in the Netherlands, so just 15, a couple years ago. 15 yeah. years. No, 25. Oh, tw- oh 2014. Okay, I thought you said 24. Yeah, that is a long time. Yeah. <clears throat> and there's not much different between, that. like, there's not much, a whole lot of differences between the U.S. and Dutch version other than the Dutch version had seven-letter puzzles, as opposed to the U.S., which had five-letter puzzles. They didn't always have seven letters, but, you know, they kind of... Mm-hmm. I think towards the end, like, they did, like, six letters on Mondays and Wednesdays, and, like, maybe seven letters on Friday, if some sort of, sort of formula like that. Mm-hmm. And then, obviously, the American ver- season one of the American version was taped on the Dutch set using American expatriates who were living in the Netherlands as contestants, so... Which is uh, why that season wasn't aired by Game Show Network for a long time. Still isn't, but... Well, it wasn't rerun. It was yeah, yeah. aired initially. Yeah. How many do you have from the initial season one run? Do you know? Uh, let's see. I think I have uh, at least a dozen. Like, uh, maybe all, but like a few. Okay. Well, I like good. to have all of them, though. That's more than most. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder, you know, I guess if you film it in the... Well, who knows how that legally works, but... Again, the American version... As much as you love the American version with Chuck Woolery... It, pales in comparison to the success of the Dutch version mm-hmm. in terms yeah. of longevity. So yeah, good for Lingo. Good run. Next we move on to The Weakest Link. Yeah, The Weakest Link started in the UK, and uh, when it started in the US, they actually had the same host, yeah. Dan Robinson, who uh, flew from England to LA numerous times just to do both shows. Yeah, and they hired... Originally they were going to audition a bunch of different people, but they ended up going with her because I think she captured the spirit of it well. Plus, America's just like mean British people, I think. <laughs> we prefer that over mean Americans or mean Canadians. Yeah. She was really the first mean... Well, no, I guess the uh, the Inquisitor from Inquisition was mean, but... Yeah, but not as much as Ant was sometimes. That's true. And the American ver- And I think we can safely say that the American version was never that big of a... It was... The American version was weird in that... It hit really, really hard for like a minute and then went away. I don't remember people really actively watching Weakest Link. I know you weren't there for it at the time, but there was a lot of hype around it. 
before it premiered, and then when it premiered, it kind of, uh, what's the word, it like, all sizzle, no steak, or it just, it went up in flames really quickly, and then it went away. Yeah, NBC promoted the heck out of it when yeah. it was first, um, you can find like a lot of the promos online if you look hard enough. It was it was super mega promoted. It was because mil- everyone at the time was looking to find the next kind of who wants to be a millionaire for their network. Yeah. Although with the weakest link, it's very um, almost near impossible to win a million dollars because you'd have to you like get the perfect chain every single time. Which yeah. I think I wonder what the most amount of money anyone's ever won on that show. I think it was... I, I only remember a perfect chain happening once on the original American series. Oh, yeah. So so, for some, so I'm thinking it was like 137000 something like that. Oh, like over the whole show? Yeah, like that, yeah that, was, that was the most for the entire show, and I think that was the highest it ever got. It certainly never surpassed 150000 Yeah, because that's, you know, it's hard enough to get a perfect chain once. You have to get a perfect chain every single time. Mm-hmm. I don't think I, I I would have to look it up. That'd be an interesting thing to look up after we're done. Is what was the most uh, the the most perfect chains ever in one episode? Mm-hmm. But the British version was on I think from 2000 to like 2016. Like it it went off pretty recently. Oh, it said uh, 2000 to 2012, but they did do a special of it uh, just last year. Yeah, with Anne Robinson hosting, I believe. Mm-hmm. See, that's the great thing about British TV is they can do specials like that. We can't. <laughs> we're we're American. By the way, we're American slash Canadian. We don't get that luxury. Right. Yeah. Um, do you want to talk? Do you have anything else but we could sling before we go to Deal or No Deal? Uh. Well, yeah, because uh, the the American version we had two different hosts. We had Ann Robinson, and then we had George Gray. Uh, what do you period. think? Of, yeah. What do you think about George in comparison to Ann? Um. I mean, he he wasn't bad, but the problem is the show was marketed so heavily under Ann Robinson. I don't think it stood a chance with any host other than her. Mm. I mean, he made the. I mean, I don't. I don't think he tried to be Ann, so that's a good thing. That I I don't disagree. I mean, whether he was good or not, I think it didn't matter at the end of the day. Whoever you got was going to be a letdown from who the original host was. Mm-hmm. All right. And that syndicated version only was on for like one year. Yeah, and so. the NBC was on for two years. And there were some episodes of the NBC version which they didn't get to air, which later on aired on either PAX or uh, the Game Show Network. Mm-hmm. Who was the contestant to link it to? Who was the name of the contestant who was on The Weakest Link and then the next show we're going to talk about? Oh, I, oh, Deal or No Deal. That's, uh, his name is Mor- Morris. Okay. And, and the both UK versions. Okay. And so then we get to go to Deal or No Deal. Right. Which, think, uh, rec- which recently came back in the United States. Yeah, I guess. Have, Have you, you watched, watched the new version one? No, I'm going to say oh, no. I, I, <laughs> I've watched a few episodes. I think I recorded some as well. Okay. I'm it's not s- stupid. I thought someone likes it. I know, I, I, but I didn't like the It's not that I think the new one is worse than the original. It's just I didn't like the original American version to begin with. The British version, I watched the crap out of. I love the British version, but the American oh, yes. version just never did it for me. Even though the show originated in the Netherlands... Was called Million Shark. Million Yacht. Million Yacht. Look for the millions or hunt for the millions. Hunt, hunt for million, yeah. Yeah. But yeah, 26 bucks. Although Britain, it was 22, right? Yes. Yeah, and we got 26. So. We did have 22 on the American syndicated version, though. Mm hmm. No one ever won the top prize ever on the American version, legitimately. We had the two winners, but that yeah. was during the million dollar mission. Mm-hmm. But we had a, a, like at least twenty people that uh, brought the million dollars to their own taste in a normal game, and none of them had the guts to continue the game. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know what's funny? Because uh, I was just thinking about this recently, and I'm kind of glad we have to re-record this because this this did not happen when we initially recorded this audio. Do you remember okay. the uh, the the first guy on the newest Deal or No Deal? I think so. The guy who lost like three hundred thirty. The guy who oh who, <laughs> yeah, that was yeah. that was painful. What's funny is is that everyone's like, you idiot, you lost, you suck, you didn't take the money. But if he had ended up getting the 750000 people would be saying the exact opposite. Mm. They'd be saying, like, good for you, you're amazing, you won, hooray, you're so brave, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. This goes to show you how you know a coin flip can determine your fate in this world. Yeah, it kind of depends. Yeah. 
And also, I noticed that one of the – I don't know if you saw Cheryl, Cheryl Jackson's episode of Deal or No Deal. It was a very early one in 2006. She won only $5. Mm-hmm. And the, the sun come back? Yeah, the sun was a contestant on the newest version. Yeah, and she is. came back as a supporter at the supporters yeah. bench that they have. I don't want to spoil it for you, but I will tell you he does win more than $5. So. Oh, well, that, that's good. I haven't seen it, but I saw it on the news. <laughs> okay. I don't think that I'm spoiling it too much. He will, I assure you he will walk out of there with more than $5. How much yeah. more? Tune in to find out. Yeah, he wins uh, $1 more. <laughs> At least. Okay, is it possible to win $6 on Deal or No Deal? Uh, maybe. I guess, I guess if you had like yeah. 10 and 5 or the last two, I guess the bank... 10 and would... 1. I think 10 and 1, that would be $6. <laughs> That would be six dollars total. No, I meant like if you had one dollar and ten dollars at the last two cases, and six dollars was the. Get, oh yeah, you're right. It would be six. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Okay. I know that happened on like the syndicated version a few times, where it was down to like one dollar and like forty dollars or something. Oh god, yeah, there were a lot of people with only one like three digit amounts of money or less on the syndicated version. Yeah. Much more, much more than on the primetime version, mm-hmm. but. Oh, so the the British version actually was on for quite some time. It was on before. for about 10, 11 years, I think. Mm-hmm. And I always preferred the British version just because I thought it was more tense and more fair. More fair? They didn't throw in a bunch of gimmicks. Oh, that's true. I yeah, didn't like because, the gimmicks. Because uh, the, in the UK version, you had very serious people with, uh, you know, f- um, sometimes sad backstories. And you had that occasionally on the American version, yeah. too. But... Um, on the American version, you would have, uh, what, a pony as an offer? Did you see that episode? Yeah. Well, and they yeah. always try to rig it on the American version so that you'd win something. Like, they would be like, you get ten grand no matter what, yay. But with the British... Oh, that's, that's what happened with uh, Richie Bell's episode. Yeah. With the British version, like, you got a guy in a wheelchair, and it's like, well, look, if you pick the wrong case, you know, it sucks, but just because you're in a that's wheelchair... It. Just because, yeah. I mean, we don't want you to walk out with it, but, you know... That's that's how it works. And plus, some people would get very sad whenever like the big amounts of money were off the board. Mm-hmm. We need to talk about the One P Club. Oh which yeah, is, the One P Club. They which, made. They, it's very funny. Which is a phenomenon of the British version. It's not something you'd see in the American version. The One P Club was uh, what everyone who would want a penny on the UK version of Deal or No Deal, which was at least thirty, forty, somewhere in that area. Yeah. Who is wonder? Could, uh, Go ahead. I said I could be wrong, so what are you going to say? <laughs> I was going to say, I always wondered how more people ended up winning the penny than the million dollars, but I guess more people backed out. Be- or, well, because the, the British version, they didn't have a million dollars. It was 250000 Yeah, a quarter mil. Yeah, so. Maybe that's why there were more people willing to go for it in the British version, because the risk was a little bit lower than the American version. Mm-hmm. I don't know Maybe. many people that would risk $750,000 for a chance at the million when, they've already, when they could end up walking with like a $300. I wouldn't do that. <laughs> I'm not getting yelled at by guys on the internet. Oh yeah, but if you won a million dollars, they would say the exact opposite. <laughs> Thank you. But yeah, in the UK version, I also kind of think it's interesting how the bankers on these international versions are a lot different. Yeah. Because uh, in the UK, the offers are. Uh, let's see what the, what the bankers are supposed to do. It's not necessarily about math. I've all in the American primetime version at least. I would think it's like a little bit of math plus a little bit of uh, contestant thought or whatever. Mm-hmm. But in the UK version, the offers are completely uh, way too low than how they should be, even with that. I was wondering how they and it, it. and it was similar on the U.S. syndicated version, where the offers were way lesser than how they would have been on the primetime version. Mm-hmm. Well, I know on the Amer- on the British. Um... <laughs> Hold on, give me a minute to turn my brain. Was it, I think it was the British version. I remember a clip where the banker countered two different times. Like where the contestant said, no swap, and then he said, are you sure you want to swap? And then she changed her mind and she swapped. And it ended up being wrong. I can't remember what it was. It was like some insane reverse psychology, and she ended up... I never things. saw that episode. That sounds like something the British banker would do, though. Yeah. Something Although that... they, did, they did have something on there called the banker's gamble. Oh, yes. Box 23? Or is that something no, that's different. different. That's, okay. that's something. Talk about the Banker's Gamble, then we'll talk about Box 23. Well, the Banker's Gamble was, uh, I don't, it only happened once or twice, I'm not sure. But it did happen for the second uh, person to win a quarter million dollars because she had dealt early, I think it was like at eight boxes or something, she dealt with uh, 17,500 pounds. 
Mm-hmm. So then we get to the last two boxes. She's playing out the rest of the game as if she had gone on, as they always mm-hmm. do. The banker calls and offers her the banker's gamble. So here's what happens. She she had one P and a quarter million as the last two boxes. The worst and the best. Right? So the banker calls and offers the banker's gamble, which is you give back the money you dealt at in exchange for your box. And uh, she took that and won the quarter million. Is that only offered if it's one P versus 250000 uh, I'm not sure. I don't know. I'm. I know it was. I'm sure it was offered more times than that, but I'm not sure the details. That I need to see. Now, I'm more familiar with Box Twenty Three. Yeah, Box Twenty Three was interesting too. Box Twenty Three is a box with the number twenty three on it, uh, and there's five possible situations in the box. I'm not sure how they determine which one will go in the box, but that's a different thing for a different day. Uh, one is double your money, where. You could double your money. One is half your money, where you could end up having half of the end money you ended up winning. One is plus five thousand. One another. What was the other one? I know the, the last one is. I think it was a uh, ten thousand. Plus ten thousand, and then the last one is lose everything. Yeah, nothing half. I think there was one where you just keep your money. At the, at the same, oh yeah, same. Right? That's what it was. Yeah. Half. That's. I think that's what it was. Half, same, double. Plus, plus 10,000, 10, nothing. Mm-hmm. And again, you're offered it. You can choose to not take it at all, or you can choose to go for the box, and you've got a chance at walking out with double your money or walking out with nothing. Mm-hmm. And I remember there was one guy who won the quarter of a million dollars on the British version who would have gotten a double if yeah. he'd gone for it. Yeah. But, you know, still congratulations for him. Yeah. I wonder how they would have handled a half a millionaire on that show. You want to go to Dog Eat Dog? Yeah, sure, why not? <laughs> it's a Dog Eat Dog world, and uh, I believe it originated, yeah, it definitely originated in the UK. Mm-hmm. There's like one episode online, if you can find it. Good luck. Yes, it's a very good episode. <laughs> and we watched it, uh, We didn't, I think we watched it together, but yeah, we, we watched that episode. That one, I always prefer the British version over the American version. Mm. Just because every... I've, I've... Yeah, I've seen the American version more than the British version. The American version is more readily available because GSN reran it. Although it, the British version did air in America on BBC, big uh, BBC One here in the U.S. Was it BBC America? Yeah, BBC America. Okay. And it also aired. They also aired another show. I can't remember what it was called, um, but it was where five people play. I'm sure a bunch of game show people listening to this are pissed that I don't remember this off the top of my head. But it was f- five people, and one of them has been given all of the answers. Oh, you're thinking Hollywood Showdown? Is that no, it? this is a different one. No, that's not Hollywood Showdown. Okay. One oh, of them oh, 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 uh, Dirty Rotten Cheater? Something like that. One of them has been given all of the answers, and they all have to answer the questions. And then the last person has to... Then, like, when they get to the end of the game, everybody has to take a vote, and they have to figure out who they think the cheater is. And if they're right, then the other four get to split the, the amount of money that was accumulated. But if they're wrong then the cheater gets all the money. Hmm. That's interesting. Mm-hmm. Was, yeah. it a UK, was it a UK game show or US? Yes, UK. I don't think there was ever an American one. Okay. I remember because I liked it, but yeah. Dog Eat Dog. British version That's... was better, even though I think it was on for less time. The US version, uh... I mean, it, it had the same concept, pretty much, right? Yeah, it had the same concept, but all the stunts were, like, way more elaborate. They were all and, more. Uh, they were more fear, dangerous. more fear factor ish. Yeah, but were they less dangerous? Because I know that there was at least one guy on the U.S. show, maybe on the first episode, who almost died and had yeah. to go to a hospital. Yeah, I think it was the pilot up. Epi- the first episode of Dog Eat Dog. One of the guys, like they did this thing, which again, this this always seems like a bad idea. I don't know why shows do this, but where these two guys are basically underwater, attached to a bungee system, and. Uh, they have to try to stay down there as long as they can, and if they let go of the cord, they end up getting like yanked out of the water. And then I guess the guy who didn't, end, the guy who came, who got pulled up first, ended up like accusing the show of giving him brain damage because he was down there for so long. Uh, there was there was articles at the time. You could probably find some if you look hard enough online. But I know that they silenced that pretty quick. Yeah, they probably paid for it or something. Yeah. Oh, I just found out the name of the show you might have been talking about. It was is it called The Enemy Within? Yes. Okay. The Enemy Within. I don't, I don't remember what Dirty Rotten Cheaters was. 
Yeah, they tried to do a version of it in the U.S., which essentially was Dirty Rotten Cheater, but yeah. Okay. Yeah. Dog Eat Dog. This is by Brooke Burns. Yeah, who later uh, achieved greater fame as the co-host of The Chase yeah. on Cheat 7. I wish that was. I wish the chase was still on. I really yeah, wish it did, was. I know they're rerunning it, but I wish they yeah, had didn't. Episode. Didn't we talk about how uh, did they stop filming for the chase because they uh, kept giving out too much money? I can't remember if it was on one we aired or not, but yeah, I know that. The, I, that's my theory. I don't know if anyone. I, I, I didn't read this. This is solely our, my conspiracy theory, but I think the reason that the show went off the air was because uh, that they they the show gave away such huge prize prize amounts that at a certain point it was more beneficial to just rerun the old episodes than to make new ones mm -hmm. yeah but on the episodes where the beast won that cost the network nothing really because i don't think they gave the beast any money for doing it other than mm -hmm. being a cast member of the show and even if there even if it was like money it was probably like a, like nothing compared to what the contestants would have won of course yeah. uh, you want to talk about card sharks Oh, card sharks, yes. Card sharks, or play your cards right with Bruce Forsyth. Bruce Forsyth. It's identical to the American version, only it's played with couples instead. Mm -hmm. Didn't they, uh, and card sharks had uh, kids every now and then, right? The American version did. I don't think the foreign versions ever did. Oh. Maybe I'm remembering it. But yeah, it did have kids on the American version. Yeah, higher or lower guessing game with cards. And I know the British version was like super successful and super identified with Bruce with Sir Bruce Forsyth. Mm -hmm. and I don't know. I don't think we talked about this because I don't think it was released when um, we discussed this. But S S uh, Wink Martindale uploaded an episode from the New Zealand version of Card Sharks. Oh, really? Like a very rare episode of the New Zealand version of Player Cards, right? So go check that out if you can find it. That's interesting. Yeah. Bruce Forsyth posted a few other game shows as well. He was pretty. He was a pretty big deal in the UK. Uh, yeah. he only he, hosted, he was also a musician. Yes, uh, I think it was. And uh, he only hosted one show in the US. It was Hot Streak. Did you ever see Hot Streak? I think maybe once or twice. Yeah. Okay. Did not do well because it was up against The Price Is Right, and ironically, he would end up hosting the British version of The Price Is Right. <laughs> right. Uh, but that was on for, I think, five years in the UK. Yeah. Catchphrase? Oh, Catchphrase, yeah. One of my favorites. Catchphrase, a show that was created uh, and it ended up only being on American TV for one season. I believe it was one of the last things Art James did. One of the last shows he hosted regularly. He certainly made other things afterwards. But uh, oh, yeah. it was, you guessed, catchphrases based on sort of pictures. You're going to see a picture of a catchphrase in this in the YouTube video of this oh, yes. and to give you an idea of what a catchphrase would be. Mm -hmm. And the idea was to solve these catchphrases and you'd win money. And I guess it didn't do super well here in the U.S., but... It did U very successful in England. Yeah, it ended up being on for, like, how long? 1989 to, like, 2013? I, I, think, I think it might be still running in the U.K. Yeah, it was on for a long time. I know they tried making another pilot after the success of the U.K. version in the U.S., but that didn't go anywhere either, so... <laughs> So what do you and, think? Uh, what do I think about? What do you think? What do you think makes an American show work well overseas and not well in the U.S.? Uh, I guess a good host, uh, like a good game formula. Um, keep it more about the game and less about gimmicks. Mm -hmm. Maybe. Maybe. Why do you? Th I mean, I, again, there's. I have no way of knowing why something like Catchphrase did so well in other countries, other than just. I guess it did. Yeah. yeah. You were going to say something before I interrupted you. But... Yeah, I was going to say that uh, <clears throat> if you most uh, U.S. game show fans remember the U.K. version of Catchphrase because of a particular blooper that they've seen in many specials. Which will be in this video, but or still frame of it, but the infamous Snake Charmer clip. Yes. Mm -hmm. We're not going to tell you what he's doing because we can't say that on the podcast. He's a snake. So... He's charming a snake. I don't get yeah, why exactly. you... Yeah. Yeah, it, but, you know, it might look like something else to those dirty-minded people out there. So we'll, we'll put the link in the description. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, yeah, they, they aired the blue. That, that's one of those bloopers that they show all the time. Someone probably gets a lot of money for that blooper. But they show that blooper everywhere. Yeah, Kinda I wonder like, if the, the contestants get any money. I don't think it. so. I know Jim Peck said that he still gets, like, paychecks from the blooper of him falling down the stairs on 
the big showdown. They aired that every week. Oh. Stez, he still gets like checks. It's for you know, it's it's for like thirty cents, but he still gets checks from like all over the world for that blooper. That's funny. Mm-hmm. That's uh, turning a po- negative into a positive. There. Yeah. It's a pretty good moment if you've seen it. Mm-hmm. He laughs it off. That's good. Although I remember the picture, I remember the the moment of the uh, the Australian version of Wheel of Fortune. This this is another one that they showed everywhere where uh, the host of the Australian version runs out and falls, and everyone runs over to make sure he's okay. And he's like, "Yeah, yeah, I'm fine, I'm fine." And he gets back up, and he's just like, "Hello, welcome to Wheel of Fortune." He just <laughs> completely brushes it off. I think I've seen that before. And have you seen uh, Ross Schaefer's fall on uh, Match Game ninety? No, I need to look uh, that one up. I've seen. Was it Edie McClurg accidentally stabbing Gloria Loring in the back of the card? I remember that clip. No, no I don't. I don't remember that. But it, was, it wasn't that much. She so. throws the card, and it, she like throws the card kind of casually, not realizing it's like flimsy, and it ends up falling straight down and hitting Gloria Loring in the back. And Gloria oh. Loring fakes like she's just been stabbed. Oh, that's funny. I'll have to look that one up. Yeah. Um. Do you want to go to the next show? Yeah. Why not? Sale of the century. Which was on for a very long time in Australia, was it? Australia. Because Reg Grundy uh, essentially stole the rights to the show. He came to America, he found, saw the show on TV in the 70s, brought it back to Australia, and it was on from like 1980 to, God, I think like 2000. It was on forever. That's nice. And it was on for only uh, three, four years in the United States? The original version, I think, was only on for two years, and then... But because the Australian version was so huge, they brought it back in the 80s. But that was only on for six years, I think. Oh, okay. But still, it was and, never uh, as big. Episode, as... In uh, Australia? Yeah, it was never as big as it was in Australia. But, I and mean, didn't no... you say it was uh, the most popular television program in Australia? Not just game shows, but yeah. television at all? That that was in the Ballyhoo, and I'm pretty sure that's true. Because that <laughs> was a big deal. Hmm. Huh. It's in, like there's the pitch tape that exists somewhere. You can find it online where they're pitching the Australian version for American television, and they they drive that point home pretty hard. And I it wouldn't surprise me if it was true. Oh okay. Yeah, I like I like the U.S. version of Sale of the Century, and uh, the Australian one was uh, on for a long time. It's, they're basically identical. Yeah. I'm surprised they didn't film the American version in Australia with the Australian ex, with American expatriates living there like they did with Lingo, but. Another and the Ameri- <laughs> yeah, and the American version was hosted by a Canadian. Is that right? Uh, American Canadian, because Jim Perry was born in New Jersey, but he's oh. one of the. I think he ended up. I think I, I gotta have to look into the history of that. But he, um, I think he he was American, but he ended up hosting a lot in Canada. Oh yeah. So I, I, think. I think he had Canadian citizenship. I don't know how he got it, but he uh, ended up hosting in Canada a lot because he hosted. Um, I think it was Headline Chasers Forever, which was a big show in Canada. Uh-huh. And, then and he, he hosted a couple of Miss Canada pageants in the 70s and 80s. Yeah, and then he came to America, and they he, they talk about this in uh, one of the game show books I have, that he was like the most famous face, like the most famous Canadian. It was completely unknown in America, but he ended huh. up getting known because of card sharks. Huh. And then moving on to Sale of the Century. So, okay. The most experienced game show host who had never worked in America. Jim Perry. Yep. What a guy. Unique story. I'm trying to think of anyone else had a unique, any other American host had a unique story like that. Peter Tamarkin, maybe? Isn't he yeah. Canadian as well? No, he was American. Oh. He was American. But That's... he wrote for, he was, he was, um, he wrote for like Esquire. He wrote, he was like a fashion magazine writer. Huh. Before he ended up hosting game shows, so. Didn't <laughs> Yeah. And uh, there's a couple of, yeah, it's always interesting looking up the uh, previous occupations of game show hosts. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Bob and Eubanks. sometimes, uh, Bob Eubanks, oh yeah, he was the manager for the Beatles. He uh, he brought them to the U.S. I don't know if he managed, I guess he did, the, he managed the American tour, certainly. Mm-hmm. Too bad Bob never got to sing with them. <laughs> was Bob Eubanks a singer? I don't think he's a singer. I know, but that would have been interesting seeing Bob Eubanks sing with the Beatles. Yeah, I'm sure there's interviews. Of, I know there's pictures of him with the Beatles, so. I but haven't that, seen it, but that would be nice. Yeah. Well, that's one of those. That was actually a question on Trivia Trap at one point, <laughs> uh, which was another short-lived game show that Bob hosted. He said, who brought the Amer- who brought the Beatles to the U.S. on their first American tour? And the answer was Bob Eubanks. 
Yeah. Did Bob uh, act like he didn't know or what was He this? did. Yeah. And they, they actually thought the answer was not Bob Eubanks. <laughs> and so he's like, you don't think it's me? Okay, I hope you're right. Let's cut me. Oh, no, it was me. Wow. Yeah. Kind of like on, I don't know if you, did you see that clip of Greed where uh, they ask, it was a question about yes. Chuck. And they ask him, uh, which of these shows did not feature Chuck Woolery as a regular host? And these contestants said it was Wheel of Fortune that he did not host, which most people know is wrong. And they lost on the first question because yeah. of that. Never hosted Singled Out. Singled Out. What, what was that show? Was uh, that, that, was a, that was a dating show on MTV. Um, oh, yeah. Okay. They would have, like, one guy, and then behind him were, like, like 50 or so girls. And he would, he would like, uh, eliminate answer based on that so it'd be like you know eliminate all of the einsteins or eliminate all of the beer steins and you'd pick one and you'd eliminate all of the anyone who fell in all the women who fell in that category and it would basically be like a process of elimination till he was left with just one and they ended up winning a dream date yeah it was an mtv Although, show yeah, chuck would have been good on that show <laughs> it would have been interesting but it was very mtv so it was hosted by chris hardwick Oh, Chris Hardwick. Uh, before was, uh, yeah. at midnight, that's a good show. Yeah, pre and uh, uh, Chris Hardwick and uh, who was it? Jenny McCarthy was the other one. Oh yeah, Jenny McCarthy or Jenny McCartney? That was it's McCarthy, the one that dated Jim Carrey. Yeah, it's McCarthy. And then after she left, Carmen Electra got the job. We do not recommend watching it. I don't recommend watching it. Blockbusters. It was a great American show, and it did horribly in the ratings for no reason. <laughs> And Bill Cullen hosted it, yep. and it's still been terrible. Yeah, not bad because, and it's one of those shows that's like there's no reason why it was why it didn't do well. Yeah, they do. You look at it, it's like why did this fail? There's no reason. Mm. And I think I think in Adam's book, Quizmaster, which you can buy, Adam, the death. Yeah, you can find that online. Uh, I think he even says like they did testing to see like what's wrong with it. They they mark they uh, what do you call it? focus grouped it, like what's wrong with the show, and everyone said nothing is wrong with the show. It's like huh. Well, that's weird, because no one's watching. Sometimes that happens. I had a feeling it might have been because of the two versus two contestants versus one aspect. You'd think that, but then they did the version later with the one versus one, and that didn't do well either. So. Yeah, but that version didn't have Bill Cullen. That's true. It was Jerry Rafferty. Jerry Rafferty. Bill, that was not Bill. Jerry Rafferty. Jerry Rafferty sang uh, Baker Bill, Street. Bill, Bill Rafferty. Bill Rafferty. The late Bill Rafferty, yeah. Another guy, DJ, in New York, I believe. Bill was a good host, too, but he hosts... Most of the shows he hosted don't last very long. Yeah. I just realized both hosts... I didn't realize this till now. Both hosts were named Bill. Huh. <laughs> I never noticed that before. Yeah, But the British version was hosted by Bob Holness. Bob Who Holness. was James Bond on radio, for those who don't know. And the, the difference between the British version and the American version was... It was still two versus one, but it was kids. It was teenagers competing. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. And that one ended up going on for like 19 series or something. Some insane number. And it was the same format, pretty much? Exact same format. Um, the only difference was, there were, I mean, there were a few little aesthetic differences, but the only really big difference was at the goal, the prize was not, five, like, I, I don't think you're allowed to give money to kids in England. <laughs> so it's like, the it was like a prize is what you get if you completed the gold run. Oh, like a trip or something? Yeah, trip, and then, like, it, with each subsequent one, the trip would, like, the prize would get even bigger, and I think the, I remember one episode where a kid won, like, a trip to India, <laughs> which, you know, you could never he do. Give, yeah, he probably enjoyed that. You couldn't give that away on the U.S., but certainly there, and I don't think, I think, I could be wrong, I know in Australia you don't, but I think you don't have to pay taxes on your prizes in, in England. Yeah, I think so, and in Australia. Yeah, definitely not in Australia. But that's how it is in the United States. Yeah. Uncle Sam gets his cut. Mm -hmm. We're going to talk about Funhouse. Because I love Funhouse. Both the U.S. Yeah. and the British one. Yeah. What was the, was there much of a difference between the two? Um, the only big difference I can think of is the pri The power prize was... Uh, on the American version, if you pick the right tag, you won the power prize. In the British version, if you pick the right tag, they asked you a question in order to win the power prize. But other than that, it was pretty much the same. Oh, okay. You had to answer a trivia question to win the power prize, but, you know, it was usually a pretty easy question, like, name three states in the U.S., which, 
even kids in Britain, I think, know the most of the states in the U.S. Well, that's that's assuring. Yeah. And there was another one. It was like name three um, types of clouds or something like that. Stuff that name not <laughs> not yeah. super tough questions for children. Name something a burglar does not want to see when he breaks into a house. Oops, wrong show. <laughs> no, that's a different thing. I think, by the way, off tangent, I think that may be the best moment in the history of television, in the history of Family Feud. Yeah, because I think right. it's just, I think that moment was just perfect. I don't know what it is. Yeah, or a uh, Family Feud in general, or just Steve Harvey. Certainly the Steve Harvey version. I think that's the best moment, Steve Harvey yeah. version. You Not get just a good moment. You get a good moment in at least every Steve Harvey episode, at least once. Yeah. Well, because I love what what people remember is people remember Steve's reaction, but what I love is. The, the guy, the other guy, not the guy who said naked grandma, but the other guy. The guy on the other side of the podium. Yeah, the guy on the other side of the podium, he's like, I don't want to see that either. <laughs> <laughs> that was like the perfect cap. Yeah. And then uh, Steve says, okay, turn it, and it comes up as uh, occupant or gun. And he's like, that's the occupant person? Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> I just, what was the other one? Uh, name, name an occupation with a lot of neurotic people. Which, by the way, for those who aren't super literate, neurotic means kind of Think of like a Woody Allen type, if you can. Yeah. And someone says porn star. Was this on Steve Harvey? Yeah, this was on the Steve Harvey version. And someone said porn, and the person said porn star, and the card turns over and it says actor, and Steve Harvey's like, really? <laughs> we're counting well, a... that's true. That counts. We're that's counting awesome. a porn star as an actor. Yeah. Have you ever seen a porn actor <laughs> act? <laughs> How early was this in Steve Harvey's run? Do you I know? think this was second or third season. Okay, you see, by then he wasn't used to it, but nowadays he's just, yeah. you know, he doesn't even care now. He really plays up to it, which I again, I know Steve Harvey gets so much crap, but I think his, I think he really saved that. Oh, version. he saved a few, no doubt yeah. about it. Like people say, John O'Hurley. I'm like, John O'Hurley was so boring. I'm sorry, mm -hmm. John O'Hurley, if you're listening to this, which I know you're not, but the John <laughs> Hurley, John O'Hurley version was so boring. It was literally just, is it Martha Stewart? No, I guess not. Okay, you didn't win. And uh, the bullseye bringing back in John O'Hurley's last season didn't help things either. No. That's one of those... Uh, there's an interview with someone at Fremantle who said that. It was like, why is this still on? We ought to change this if we want to keep this on the air, and that's why Steve Harvey was brought on. And clearly right. it was the correct decision. And back when, I think we may have talked about this before, I'm not sure if this was on a podcast or not, but uh, when you said that when John O'Hurley or Richard Carden was the host, it wasn't as talked about as much. I don't remember anyone talking about the John O'Hurley or Richard Carden version. Oddly enough, I remember people talking about the Louis Anderson version. But I feel yeah. that was I feel that was in passing the same way we talked about Weakest Link earlier, where it was like people were watching it, but they weren't really watching it. Yeah. They were aware of it. They were focused on Louis Anderson and how uh, uninterested he was in the job. Yeah, people remember Louis Anderson being uninterested, but Richard Karn really wasn't interested either. He was like, "I'm Richard Karn." Let's triple the points. Let's yeah. double the points. Yeah, that's Richard Karn. They had to do a bunch of that crap. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you ever watch the behind the the E True Hollywood story of Family Feud? It's online. Yeah, still. I have seen a few episodes. Yeah. The e true no the e true Hollywood story of yeah I, oh the, yeah I mean I've seen that a couple times I don't okay. know why I said episodes <laughs> okay I just remember watching and thinking wow this is basically just Howard Flesher takes a huge crap on on Richard Dawson and Ray yeah Holmes, Howard who was the producer of Family Feud and Super Password later mm -hmm. yeah. I don't know. Howard and Howard and Richard didn't always get along no according and, to that documentary. Yeah, yeah, and that well, and that's one of the problems with that documentary. And I know Richard Dawson wasn't doing interviews at that time, but it's basically just Howard Felcher talks about how much he hated working with Dawson. Yeah, and then uh, some of Ray Combs' family. Yeah, yeah. You want to talk about your favorite? I'm not your favorite, but one I know you're a huge fan of. The last one on our yeah. list. All right, the last one. Uh, some of you out there might not consider this the game show, but me and Josh do, so we're putting it on the list. It is whose line is it anyway? Uh, it is in the encyclopedia of TV game shows, and even though the, it's a faux prize with folk, I don't consider it any different than a panel show. So. Oh yeah. Yeah. When we get yeah, to. Whose line is it anyway? Yeah. There's oh, a reason why we don't talk about Survivor because Survivor's not a game show. Reality game shows are not game shows. But mm -hmm. we love Whose Line. Yes, we do. Mm -hmm. Both the British and the, U the U.S. version. The original U.S. version. Yeah. Both versions are good for different reasons. But uh, I think the U.K. version is one of those shows where it got better as it progressed. 
Agreed. because if you watch, yeah, the, the for those first couple seasons, they're kind of. I mean, it's uh, if you watch it, you feel like this isn't who's line. This is just some. They're very British, dry. Like, they're very yeah. Very and, intellectual uh, humor. Else, shut up. Let yeah, you go. It was, you, he had to be like kind of kind of smarter to watch it. And plus, there are some things even in later uh, UK episodes, which I don't get because they were British jokes or mm -hmm. so. Nobby was a kids show. For those who don't know, not what you think it is. It's a kids show. It's a yeah, kids show. Um, yeah. Well, the British version started in 1988, and they had a lot of really big name people on that on the original version. Like I remember, they had. Like Stephen Fry. Stephen Fry was on. Um, obviously, they had like Josie Lawrence and a lot of other people who weren't as big or well known. Um, I remember John they had Sessions. They had John Sessions, who was pretty well known at the time. He was sort of the driving force behind the first few years of the show. Yeah, he he was a regular in the first season, but I remember like in like a second or third season episode, they did a world's worst uh, a person to be in an elevator with, and Paul Merton. I don't, you know who that is? I'm yep. sure. He stepped down and said, "Hello, my name's John Sessions." <laughs> was and John's... everyone went, "Yeah." Well, John was not on that episode, oh boy. but and but the whole crowd went nuts because they knew it was true. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Not he's not very well liked in the uh, community. People don't like him. I don't. And I didn't hate him. I mean, he was fine. Yeah. He. I don't know. I don't. I didn't watch much from the first two seasons. Yeah. Well, I but, almost, uh Because uh, you know, go ahead. What were we going to say? A&E released the first two se two seasons of the British series in the U.S. on DVD, so I actually have that DVD. Oh, that's neat. Yeah. And the, but the problem is this was long before, like, Colin and Ryan were on the show, so... Right. So if you're a Who's Line fan of the U.S., I'd recommend uh, not watching the first couple seasons of the British version, at least until you've watched the later ones. Well, from what I've heard, BBC America, I think, only aired, like, seasons 6 through 10 of the British that's series. Right. Because mm -hmm. that was by the... That by that point, Colin and Ryan were... In most, if not all, of those episodes, they certainly weren't in most of the early episodes. They were like they would obviously they would have the occasional appearance in one or two, but yeah. it's really not. Ryan and Colin, Ryan and Colin became like semi regulars in mm -hmm. season four or five. Yeah, season five probably. But it also started. Uh, I think it's important to talk about that it started out as a radio show. Before. Started out on radio, and I believe they were sold on cassette at some point. Oh. The, the the British version it was only but it was only on for six episodes on BBC Radio, and if you're a fan of the show House MD, uh, Hugh Laurie was on uh, maybe one or two of those uh, radio episodes with Stephen Fry. He's on one because he and Stephen Fry were on uh, Juicer and Weaves, so <clears throat> they were together. They did that, and I remember um, who was the other? Yeah, Lenny Henry and Don French were pretty big in the UK. Did the radio? A bunch of people who did the radio version never came back to do the series, even though I know that they tried to get them back. Yeah, it would be interesting to see uh, Dr. House do Who's Line Today, because, you know, he's well-known. In the U.S., more so than... Yeah. I doubt that he would do it, but it would be interesting to see. Yeah. yeah. There are a couple people who uh, should have done it in the United States. Mm -hmm. but, well, uh, the big... The big, not being in reference to size, big in reference to being how much he was on the U.K. version was Mike McShane. Mike McShane, yeah. yeah. Who, uh, some Seinfeld fans, he played uh, FDR... Kramer's nemesis on that show a few episodes. Yep. I was, and I've never gotten a straight answer why he never did the American version, but... I think him and the producers got in, uh, had a dispute at the end of the seventh season, and he never appeared again. He did one final appearance in season nine, but yeah. that was about it. I've heard that, but I've never had it confirmed, so if anyone knows the reason, or if anyone can confirm that story, I'd, we'd love to hear it, but... Well, or if Mike McShane himself would like to confirm it, you can comment on the video. I'm sure Mike listens to the podcast all the time. Oh, yeah. Were there any British um, ones specifically from the British series who really only did the British series who you wish had done the American one? Well, I know Josie Lawrence did the U.S. version only once, and that yeah. was pretty good. Uh, Tony Slattery, he would be good for the U.S., but he'd be too he'd be too naughty. He, I think he, I think he, because he quit after season seven, too, and I think I heard that yeah. he wasn't doing... He had, a mental, he had a mental breakdown. Yeah, he wasn't doing super well around 1998, so... There was a. There may have been another reason why he didn't do it, but yeah. yeah. Stephen, Fr uh, not Stephen Fry. The other one, Stephen Frost, guy with the Stephen Frost. Eyebrows. He's, he's, he's pretty funny. He's really good. I liked him. And then there were. Then when they did the American, the final season they did in the U.S. Um, they had a bunch hey. of American, kind of one times try one time. Yeah, that uh, one of those were was Phil Lamar from Mad TV. Mm -hmm. Phil Lamar. He did 
version. He never did the U.S. version, although he would have been good. But I w- read one of the comments on the U.K. version was that, I don't, I don't know if it's true or not, but this guy says he saw Phil Lamar and asked him, oh, how come he didn't do Who's Line? And Phil said the producers liked Wayne better. Mm-hmm. They definitely liked Wayne. There's a lot of evidence to back that up, that Wayne was very much liked by the producers. Mm-hmm. Patrick Bristow did the British version. I think he did like he did the U- He did uh, the U.S. version, but I think that never, came... That didn't air for no, years. It, yeah, it, it didn't air until 2005 because it was one of ABC Family's like throwaway mm-hmm. burn-off episodes that they yeah. made. Yeah, and I remember Deborah Wilson from Mad TV did it, and Catherine O'Hara from SCTV did, did an episode, and... Um, this is a bunch, a bunch of people you wouldn't associate with doing imp- – do, well, no. You, they did improv, but you wouldn't think would be doing yeah. – but, but a bunch of people you, who never did the American series. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I wonder what uh, Drew Carey thinks of Clive Anderson or vice versa. I know that they only really referenced Clive once on the American series. I remember that. Do you know it what was, I'm talking I've about? Seen, I, yes, I do. I've seen that clip. Okay. What happened was I think uh, he uh, Drew called uh, Chip – Brad or something, or he called Wayne Brad, mm-hmm. and it was Wayne and Chip, and uh, and then Ryan said, "Hey, it's okay. Clive's allowed to make mistakes." Yeah, <laughs> and they all laughed because they all knew who Clive was. Yeah, because they all did. So. I love the the moments. We didn't get it as much in the U.S., but the the Greg Proops versus Clive Anderson moments. I think there's a yeah, montage yeah. online you can find that. Yeah. There's a few good Greg versus Drew moments. That, those are pretty funny. Yeah. But I guess that wraps it up. Is there anything you want to say about Who's Line? Yeah, let's talk about some of our favorite games from Who's Line. Uh, favorite game... Again, my favorite ones are ones that were almost also exclusive to the U.S. So I love Three-Headed Broadway Star. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, Scenes from a Hat's a classic. The American version more so than the British one. Yeah. I guess British version would be a good a good game from the British version. The Secret, that's one I like from the British version. I think my favorite game of all time... Might be Hoedown. Hoedown's the song that refuses to die. <laughs> and I was going to say that uh, Stephen Frost, yeah, he's pretty funny, but he sucked at Hoedown's if you ever watched that. I have, but I remember, who was the, there was one like George Went who didn't even try. <laughs> oh, yeah, George Went. He should, he would have been good on the U.S. version, yeah. but he's not really an improv guy. He's more of an actor. Mm-hmm. But, uh, yeah, he did a space travel hold-out, and he did, uh, what, two lines, and then he just says, hey, dance great, and then they'll start dancing, and then it goes to Colin. Mm-hmm. And then Colin, because we're going to put this picture in, so I really want to get this in there. Like, he never did this on the American version, but he did this a lot on the British version, where he would do a hoedown, and then halfway through he would die. Yeah, or, well, there was uh, a couple times he fainted. There was one time where he just uh, stopped talking and then just danced in position for the rest of the verse, for mm-hmm. the instrument. I remember there's one time he won the lottery hoe down. He's like, halfway through, he's like, I don't need to do this. I won the lottery. I'm rich. I can do what I want. Yeah. <laughs> and that was in both, uh, I don't know if you, but every season in the UK, they would have like two compilation shows of material they couldn't use. Mm-hmm. Sometimes they would just have like a, a bit, extra bits montage, so they wouldn't show the whole game. It was like maybe 20 second snippets. Yeah. And in one of those, it was a hoe down about gambling, and Colin says, I won the lottery. I got myself a ticket. I, I don't know. And then he says, uh, I'm rich. I can do what I want. And then he basically did the same thing in the lottery hoedown in the United States years later. I don't remember him ever doing that in the U.S. I remember him. No. Oh. They did uh, two different lottery hoedowns in the U.S., but, like, they were from the same taping, but they just, like, shot okay. two. Whatever. I'm going to look that up after, we re- after we're done recording, because I want to hear mm-hmm. that. Pretty good. Favorite? Yeah. So yay for the hoedown. As much as they didn't enjoy doing it, we loved watching their pain. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I know there's one blooper that I loved where it's Josie Lawrence or that she has to rap about fish. And she, I think I hear that. And she can't rap. She can't come up with anything. And Clive starts to rap for her. Yeah, Clive. I wonder why uh, Clive never participated in the games and they had Drew do that on the U.S. version. I, Drew, I think with that, they wanted to make that the prize because in the American series, originally they didn't read the credits. Uh-huh. And so they needed the prize. The prize is you get to do something with Drew. Yeah, he said, yeah, yeah. then the winner gets to do something with me after the show. <laughs> and the loser has to write about, has to report it to the Inquirer. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> well, in some cases... Uh, no, no. I mean, uh, in the UK, the prize for the winner was just to read the credits in a certain way. Yeah, that was always the prize, except the pilot. Oh yeah. And then they, they, because originally they didn't read the credits. And then in the American version, they're like, 
Okay, fine. You can read the credits. The first series, the, that, the first season of the British of the American series, they didn't read the credits. If you've seen it, yeah. Do you I, have the DVD? I'm gonna ask. This may be more of an off-camera question. Do you have the DVD for Who's Lying to the American One? I I do. Yeah, of season one. Yeah. Yeah, I think I do. Okay. They have that blooper tape, which we don't want to get too in depth in, because if if this because in an attempt to keep this safe for work, that blooper tape goes way beyond safe for work. Yes, yeah. we'll save that for another podcast. Okay. Maybe. All right. But I guess that's it for this episode. Yeah. And this right. is the second time we've recorded it, too. Okay. So the first thing we're going to do when we get done is make sure that it recorded properly. And if it didn't, then we're going to be really pissed. Yes. Okay. But uh, I'm Josh McLeod. I'm Dan Lewis. And thanks for listening. And uh, remember, it's hard to see the end when you're beginning. Exactly. <laughs>